Many thanks. I now call Neil Finlay to be followed by Claire Adamson. Up to six minutes. Thanks, President Officer. I'm afraid the First Minister's speech yesterday was a speech that will probably have reinforced the belief amongst a growing number of people outside this chamber that politicians and those they represent live in different worlds, because the reality of life in Scotland is not the nirvana that the First Minister attempts to portray. Contemporary Scotland is a pretty ugly place and a brutal place if you're out of work with no savings, if you're ill, if you're disabled or you're vulnerable. It's a place where almost a million Scots live in relative poverty and 160,000 children in absolute poverty. And it's a place where 650,000 households are experiencing fuel poverty at the same time as the six big energy companies make 15 billions of profit. And the situation is getting worse with Scottish Government in action. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Brenda Boardman, the very person who coined the term fuel poverty. This week she criticised the, and I quote, the feeble, inadequate, namby-pamby approach of the Scottish Government in tackling increasing fuel poverty. And Scotland is a place where in our most deprived communities, not at the moment, in our most deprived communities, people are living almost 19 years less than those in affluent areas. areas. It's a place where for those in unemployment, wages are cut or at best frozen, conditions reduced and rights at work threatened. And it's a place where people are going without food, as the CAB reported this week, and we see the demand for food, food parcels dramatically rising. I think it's a scandal that we sit here in this very comfortable building on our very generous salaries, and yet there is no national outcry, no coming together, no genuine collective effort made to bring people and parties together to concentrate our efforts on providing the most basic needs for our people, especially the provision of nutritious food, certainly. Kevin Stewart. Um, thank you, President Officer. I don't disagree with anything that Mr Finlay has said. And I live in the 35th poorest data zone in Scotland, which some folk don't believe in Aberdeen. But does Mr Finlay not agree that to tackle many of the issues that he has raised, including uh, taxation over fuel companies and various other things, we actually need the levers of power here to deal with these very things that he wants to see righted and I also want to put to rights as well. We need those powers. We could do better. Why is he quite happy for Westminster Tory governments to control the reins of power over this very important issue? Neil Finlay. If Mr Stewart uh, 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 was correct, and, uh, then why was it not amongst the First Minister's six big demands when he went to meet Cameron after the election? Why did he not demand that he could take action on anti-poverty issues? No. Instead, he prioritised what? Broadcasting to get his mug on the telly more often. Now, if this... Not at the moment. Oh, I couldn't bear it. Um, and if this Parliament doesn't act on this issue, then it betrays the mandate given to it when the people supported its establishment in the first place. And the words on that mace at the front are no more than window dressing for tourists. This is Scotland's real shame, and not a word in the legislative programme will address it. In his speech, the First Minister made great claims about the economy and employment, yet in the real world, with towns and villages in my region where there are levels of youth unemployment at 30 per cent. These are levels unseen since the 1980s. And we see 1,700 workers and many more in the supply and contractor chain threatened with the dole if the Dutch multinational Vion closes the Hall's meat processing plant, not to mention the knock-on impact that would have on the agricultural industry. And I would pay credit to the Finance Secretary because he has been very active on that front. Um, looking back at last year's legislative, legislative programme, we were told that the government's top priority was to accelerate uh, the recovery, boost jobs and promote economic security. It was claimed that capital investment had increased construction jobs by 11.6 per cent, compared to a 0.2 per cent drop across the rest of the UK. Well, this year, we see Scottish construction jobs fall by 6.6 per cent. And we see a growth in England and Wales uh, uh, of 1.8. And sole traders, small businessmen, joiners, painters, roofing contractors, many of whom I worked with previously, tell me that they've never seen the construction industry so bad. And this is the reality of the world out there. And we hear the 
First Minister tell us that he's creating demand by freezing council tax. But the hard facts are that 27,500 public sector jobs have been lost because and essentially imposed tax freeze as exacerbating service decline. And if you're one of those redundant workers who can't spend money on food, clothing or services, what demand are you fulfilling? And how does a strategy of mass public sector job loss square with the stated priority of providing economic security? We're told that the continuation of a no, there will be a continuation of a no compulsory redundancy policy in the NHS and Scottish Government, yet nurses and civil servants are flying out the door. If the government is so serious about no compulsory redundancies, then let this chamber legislate for it. Could you come to a conclusion, please? In procurement, Patrick Harvey raised the issue of tax avoidance, and I think we really have to come back to that during the procurement bill. And I have to ask, why does it take a Labour MSP to introduce a member's bill on the living wage when the SNP government knows it can do it, but chooses to hide behind EU directors? Thank you.